Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the forum on the, the last forum of the month of March. It is spring, and my gosh, we're supposed to have an absolutely wonderful week as well. Ladies and gentlemen, today I have an exciting announcement. I have finally learned how to spell, or how to pronounce, rather, our speaker's last name. For those of you that, thank you, thank you. For those of you that have been here regularly, you've seen me mess it up. And of course, like most things that I managed to mess up, I've learned that it's easier than I thought. Cheryl was kind enough to give me the secret pronunciation. And in just a second, we're going to learn about recycling in our state from Cheryl Burgess. See, I did it right. Cheryl, thank you for being here, and please come right on up. Thanks, folks. All right, good afternoon. Hello. Got to do the classic uh, calming drink of water before you get started. Okay, thank you so much for having me to speak. Like Rob said, I'm Sherilyn Burgess, and I am the Public Relations and Outreach Manager at Oregon Beverage Recycling Cooperative. That is a mouthful, but I'm gonna break that down for you in just a moment. I'm gonna talk to you about a few basic things today. First of all, we're gonna recap the Oregon Bottle Bill, talk a little bit about where it came from and how it's been functioning in Oregon. And we're gonna spend most of the time talking about changes that have come to the bottle bill in recent years. And I'm going to introduce you to the concept of bottle drop, which is essentially where the Oregon bottle bill is headed um, right now and in the coming years. Um, I know you do questions at the end of the speech, and so I welcome really any questions you might have. I might not have the answer, but if I don't, I'll dig it up for you later. Okay, first of all, what is Oregon Beverage Recycling Cooperative, the company I work for? We call it OBRC, so that's a little easier. And OBRC is a cooperative corporation that has been formed by almost all beverage distributors in Oregon. Essentially, we administer the functions of the bottle bill. So as many of you probably know, the bottle bill is one of the laws in Oregon, so it's in place because of the law. It's governed by the OLCC, or the Oregon Liquor Control Commission. They're responsible of, for getting someone in trouble if they're not adhering to it. But OBRC is the company that does the function, functions of the bottle bill. We literally do the pickup and process of the containers, and we also manage the deposit flow. So basically, Oregon's bottle bill is very unique in that it's a state law, but it's privately run and funded with absolutely no Oregon taxpayer dollars. I know, right? It's, it's pretty exciting, actually. <laughs> so um, OBRC operates out of eight different processing facilities in Oregon. We are a statewide company. And we are the only company that picks up Oregon bottle bill containers, um, except for a few distributors that still pick up their own uh, containers, mostly on the east side of the state. Uh, OBRC was formerly a company called Container Recovery. And so even though OBRC was formed in 2009, collectively we have almost 40 years of experience in bottle bill operations. So we can talk all day long about cans and bottles. Don't even get us started. Um, OBRC is a growing company. We are constantly opening new bottle drop centers, which we'll talk about in a moment. And we currently employ over 260 people statewide, and it's only going to get bigger from there. Uh, we operate a fleet of tractor trailers and pick up deposit containers from over 2,700 retail locations and also 15 bottle drop centers. Uh, we're also committed to community education, which is why I'm here. And we also have a presence at many state events and in terms of tabling. Uh, we also have a fairly robust fundraising support program, which is also only getting bigger. And we have a community education program where we go to elementary schools all around the state and offer a free program for, uh, that deals with recycling and the bottle bill and how that all works. Okay, let's talk about the bottle bill. People throw this term around a lot, but I find 
a lot of people don't quite understand how the bottle bill works. I'm guessing that you all probably do understand a lot more of it than the average Joe on the street, but we'll just recap for fun. The Oregon Bottle Bill was signed into law in 1971, and I'm guessing a lot of you know who did that. Governor Tom McCall, who's famous for several environmentally based things. And the Bottle Bill was one of his big stars. Now, granted, if you do some research, you'll find he had a lot of help getting the Bottle Bill going, but he still gets most of the fame. Um, before the Bottle Bill came into law, Roadside litter was made up of about 40% cans and bottles. And back then, as we know, it was mostly beer bottles and soda cans because we didn't have all the different bottles and bottled water and things that we have right now. After the bottle bill got going, that amount went from 40% down to 6%. Cans and bottles only made up 6% of roadside litter. So it was extremely successful in terms of keeping the state clean. Now this is one thing that a lot of people kind of lose sight of nowadays. We have so many recycling programs and everyone's like, yeah, recycle. But the bottle bill was initially a litter control bill. Recycling was a benefit, an afterthought. Now for a long time, the bottle bill just continued to function the way it always did. But as times changed, new types of containers and types of drinks were invented. Uh, people started buying bottled water in mass amounts as they do now. And along came all kinds of other si single serve beverages like coffees and teas and energy drinks and kombucha and aloe vera water. What is that? Um, now, according to the bottle bill, according to the letter of the law, those beverages did not fall under the bill because the bill said it was beer, like malt based beverages and soda or carbonated beverages. So now we're looking at a bill that was set forth to be a litter control bill, and now there's a whole bunch of containers that people tend to consume outside the home in litter that aren't covered under the bill. So for years, environmental groups tried to change the bottle bill, tried to get these additional things added, and there's a lot of pushback from other groups, the beverage industry certainly, and it's been a long battle. However, in 2007, they, a bill was passed that added water and flavored water to the bill. My slide says 2009 because that's when it was implemented. And it was because of this change to the bottle bill that OBRC was formed. Essentially, the bill that was passed that added bottled water, it also said that any large retailer that sells any type of soda, water, or beer has to accept empty returns of any type of brand, regardless of whether or not they sell it. So that means that before OBRC was a statewide corporation, distributors were responsible for going anywhere their containers were returned to pick them up. So if someone buys a Nestle water in Portland and then they drive to Joseph, Oregon and return it, that distributor has to send a truck all the way out to get their bottle. It really didn't make sense. And so all these different distributors that generally are massive competitors came together and decided to join, form and join a cooperative called OBRC, which allowed us to pick up and process their containers and manage the deposit return to the retailers. So the, the change in 2009 was huge. OBRC was formed. Suddenly, consumers could return containers into to any large grocery store around the state instead of where you bought it. And water and flavored water were added to the bottle bill, which increased the volume of containers as well. Now, after that happened, the, uh, the environmental groups that have been pushing for water continued pushing because it's not just water, right? I also mentioned coffee, tea, sports drinks, there are many other beverages that contribute to litter and to landfill space if they don't get recycled. So they continued pushing for these changes. Sorry, one second. The grocery system or the retailers came back and said, we're already maxed out to the gills. Everyone's returning their beverage containers, now including water, to our grocery retail rooms and we can't handle any more volume. 
along with this to make the plot thicken a little bit more, the, the redemption rate in Oregon started to go down a little bit. It, it had always been in the 90s or the high 80s. Now this is the redemption rate I'm talking about. Remember, not the recycling rate. This is only talking about beverage containers that are sold in Oregon that fall under the bottle bill and how many of those are actually returned for the nickel and therefore recycled. So redemption rate was going down. Retailers were upset about having new things added to the bottle bill. So part of the plan to address both of these problems was to introduce a redemption center concept. A couple of things that would do. First of all, that would give a place for volume to go other than retailers. At least a huge chunk of it, if you increase volume, you can stop sending it back to the grocery store and instead have it in a central place where you can do central compaction. The second thing is then you can control the return experience. At OBRC, we did a few studies. We did a phone study, we did several focus groups, and we discovered that there are two major reasons that the redemption rate was starting to decline in Oregon. The first one is the nickel itself. It's just not worth as much. Um, a lot of experts say that if the, nickel, if the deposit had kept pace with inflation, the deposit on bottles now would be about 27 or 28 cents. That'd make you stop and think over 24 pack, right? You'd be like, whoa. So nickel's worth less and less. And the second reason is the return experience itself. So I'm sure a lot of you have been to a bottle return room at a grocery store, and this is not a diss on the grocery retailers. They're trying to sell food. They're not in the recycling industry. So you go to the grocery retail room, and the floor is sticky, the machine's broken, you have to call the bottle boy like 15 times. Nobody comes out, the machine is too full, and sometimes there may be people hanging out in the bottle room that you don't necessarily want to hang out with, or maybe you don't want your like, little niece to hang out with, and that's not an insult, it's just a fact of what we heard from the community. So we said, okay, if we have this redemption center concept, if we're able to make the return experience more convenient and more clean and faster, and we're able to handle more volume, this could be a huge part of the answer separate from the deposit amount to make sure that the, the people continue to participate in the Oregon bottle bill, items continue to not be littered, and that they get recycled. So basically, in starting in 2011, I don't have all of this legislation broken down for you, but I could s email it if you were interested in it. Um, the legislature initially approved the uh, said anybody can open a bottle drop center if they want to, or I shouldn't say bottle drop, anyone can open a redemption center if they want. In a couple years later, they approved a bill that said, okay, you can do a pilot project for redemption centers. And so for us, that meant three redemption centers. Our first one was in Wood Village, then Oregon City, and then in South Salem. So we built three centers, and the OLCC measured the success of those centers and took that to the legislature. And in 2013, they approved a statewide rollout of redemption centers because the first three were so successful. So that's why there's such a wide range on the date here for the bottle drop redemption center rollout. It's because it's been a series of approvals and bills and all kinds of red tape you don't even want to think about. Um, so what is coming next in terms of legislation? It's already been passed that in 2017, the deposit is going to increase to 10 cents. Um, now, as the bill states, that was a measurement that was put into place. So remember I said that the redemption rate used to be in the high 90s, the mid 90s, the high 80s. Well, it has con continued to go down. And eventually it got low enough that the legislature said, okay, or the people that were supporting the bill said, okay, if the redemption rate does not go back up to at least 80% for two years in a row, starting measurement in 2014, then that's gonna set off a trigger to push the, push the deposit up to 10 cents per container versus five cents. 
Well, if any of you have been following the redemption rate or any of the numbers that are published by the OLCC, you'll see that the redemption rate is absolutely not at 80%. Um, last year, which is the first, or I mean, I'm sorry, 2014 was the first year of measurement, and the redemption rate was about 68, right around 68%. Um, and then in this summer, the numbers will be published for 2015. And the chances of it being all the way up to 80% in that amount of time are pretty much nil. So we are looking at a deposit increase to 10 cents in 2017, and that's most likely going to be in April of 2017. Um, then in 2018, the legislature also approved an expansion of containers. So this time, instead of saying, here are the containers that are included, now they're saying, Everything is included except these few things. So essentially, any single service type of beverage is going to be included up to a liter and a half in size that is not liquor, wine, or milk product, including things like almond milk and stuff. So we are looking at a huge increase in volume in terms of covered containers. Not only is the deposit gonna be higher, motivating people to return more, but now there's going to be a massive expansion in the, what we call the covered class of containers. Okay, due to all of what I just said, introducing Bottle Drop. So Bottle Drop is the redemption center model that OBRC came up with. So this is dreamt up and funded by beverage distributors in partnership with local retail stores. So beverage distributors pay for all the bottle drop centers to be placed and to be built, and then any redemption center within a three and a half, I mean, any retail store within a three and a half mile radius that chooses to participate helps to pay for the, the monthly functioning of the bottle drop center. Bottle drop centers are fantastic because they are indoor, they're clean, they're staffed. They offer three ways that you can return deposit containers. The first one is a hand count. At every center, we have a customer service desk with a friendly customer service associate who will hand count up to 50 containers for you. Um, they'll also take a look at any containers you have that are slightly damaged or the machine won't read the barcode there's someone right on site to look at the container for you, which is really nice. We also offer new and improved reverse vending machines. So these are similar to the machines that are at the grocery stores, but they are faster and newer. Um, just a quick show of hands, how many have been to a bottle drop center? Just a few, okay, so this is good, okay. Um, first of all, we accept 350 containers per person per day, which is more than twice what the grocery stores would accept. As you can see in the photo, the machines are a little different than the ones at the grocery stores because they don't have crushers in the bottom. So instead of accepting the container one at a time very slowly, crushing it, having jamming issues, and you have to wait, instead, every machine feeds back into a conveyor belt system that's behind the wall. And so the machine is able to accept plastic, aluminum, and glass all in the same machine and it takes it away immediately. So the machine is fast and it's smooth. And again, if you do have an issue with the machine, there's a staff member on site to help you right away. The most exciting way that we have for you to return deposit containers at Bottle Drop is our Bottle Drop account system. This is an optional system. Um, anyone can come in and use the reverse vending machines or the hand count option for free. There's Nothing, no fees associated with it. The bottle drop account does have a small fee associated with it, but it is our premier convenience option. Once you sign up for a bottle drop account, you can take home a green bag like the ones you see in the pictures. You get your first two green bags free. After that, they are 15 cents each. And it's, there's also a 25 cent processing fee for each bag that you drop off. You take the bags home, you fill them at home, as fast or as slow as you want. You can put each container type in the same bag, plastic, aluminum, glass, all in the same bag. Tie it up and you get a little barcoded sticker that is associated with your account. Put the sticker on your bag 
and you can drop it off at any bottle drop center anytime 24 7. In the top photo you see someone putting the green bag in our secure drop door so even if the center is closed and you want to drop off your bags at 2 a.m you can do it once you drop your bags off the the bag is scanned and counted by a bottle drop staff using special machinery and the money appears on your account you can access those funds either at the bottle drop center at our pay station you can either get cash or add the money to your um, use your card to get cash. Um, you can also access the funds at a participating grocery store. So every grocery store that's participating in a bottle drop has a special kiosk inside it that you see in the bottom photo and you can withdraw your funds and you can also use our plus reward program which I'm going to talk about in a second. Oh right now I'm going to talk about it. So a couple additional convenience factors are that we always have plenty of easy parking at bottle drop centers. It's one of the stipulations set forth by the OLCC. We will not get approval, approval for a bottle drop if we don't have enough parking. Uh, we always have bike racks available. We're open seven days a week and we have a bottle drop plus reward program. This is actually a program that is run by the Northwest Grocery Association and not every single retail is a participant, but many of them are. Fred Meyer, Safeway, um, I think Albertsons, a lot of the big ones. And if you use the bottle drop account, so you sign up for an account, you drop off green bags, and you have some deposit funds in your account, when you go to the grocery store to go shopping, you can scan your bottle drop card on that kiosk and print out a plus receipt, which will give you 20% more for your money at the checkout counter. You can't get cash back for it. You can only use it to purchase goods in the store, but it is a very popular program. In fact, 60% of all of our receipts that are printed out of these kiosks are all printed as plus receipts. So this is a huge convenience factor because one of the biggest complaints that people have had, or, or I should say biggest concerns, is that, hey, I used to be able to take my bottles back to the store when I was shopping, and now I have to make a separate trip. You do still have to make somewhat of a separate trip, that's true. However, now if you use a bottle drop account, you can wait till your bags are full, drop them off whenever it's convenient for you, and then the next time you're shopping at the store, you can print out your plus receipt and get 20% more for your money while you're shopping, which is what you already need to do. So it's a pretty good system, and we have found it to be extremely popular. These are the participating grocery stores that are part of the Tigard Center. I threw these in here just because it's the closest to you all, even though I know it's not exactly in your neighborhood. <laughs> so there are 13 retailers that are all participating in the Bottle Drop Center, and people can find a kiosk at any one of these. Okay, so I was just saying how our Bottle Drop system is popular, so let's look at a few figures. Um, what you see here on the map is all of the little pin drops or the little bubbles. Those are our currently operating 15 bottle drop centers. And all of the little blue dots around them represent a bottle drop account holder. Now keep in mind, these are only the people that have signed up for bottle drop accounts and use our green bag system. This is not accounting for all the people that use the reverse vending machines or the hand count option. So what you can see is that all the areas around our bottle drop centers are thick with people that are participating. And just for fun, I zoomed in on this is our Oregon City Center. And if you look really closely, it's actually difficult to find any residential street that doesn't have at least one bottle drop account holder. The little section you see that is missing things, that's a Fred Meyer. Because um, I looked at that too when I printed it. I was like, wait a second. And I was like, oh, that's Fred Meyer. Um, there are now over 90,000 households in Oregon that are bottle drop account holders, and that's just through 15 centers. These numbers have actually surpassed our own expectations, so we're kind of amazed at it as well. We've also seen now that about 44% of the state's entire redeemed container volume is coming through those 15 locations. So we still, they, 
Oregon still has 2,700 retail locations where you can return containers versus 15 centers where you can return containers, and the 15 centers are already getting nearly half the container amount. We've also seen that in all the areas that do have a bottle drop center, so within that radius around the center, we've seen about a 20% increase in volume. So this tells us that we don't have enough centers yet to move the statewide redemption needle, but we have the power to do that, essentially. <laughs> um, if we had more centers in every area around the state, there's no doubt in my mind that you would see the redemption rate go up because we've seen it happen everywhere we have one. Um, so what is next? Uh, right now, as I said, we have 15 bottle drop centers currently operating. Our goal is to build four every year, and so far we have kept up with that. In fact, we also just remodeled one of our centers that was completely overly successful. It was bringing in twice the volume that the stores before it had done, and so we just gave it a brand new remodel. Um, but we are gonna be adding another 30 centers to the state, and so what you see on this map is that all of the blue dots are current centers, and the green dots are where we plan to build. Now this isn't zoomed in very close, so it's hard to see, but we do have centers planned for Forest Grove and for Beaverton. Um, we're also increasing our fundraising support. Um, essentially, as you probably know, a lot of groups, you know, Boy Scout groups and even larger nonprofits will use the bottle bill to collect funds. They'll hold a can drive and then they'll get the container funds. OBRC and before that container recovery, we've supported um, can drives for a long time. We allow registered nonprofits to bring in a big group of containers, turn them into us, and then we cut them a check for the deposit amount. That's been very popular. We have about 12,000, or I'm sorry, about 1,200 nonprofits that do that with us at our processing plant locations. But now that we're building these bottle drop centers statewide, we're wanting to increase our fundraising because our reach to the community is getting so much greater. One thing we already do is on our website, our bottle drop website, we offer the ability for a nonprofit to sign up as a featured fundraiser. That means they have uh, their own page on our website. People can go and select and read about them. And then any bottle drop account holder, so any one of those 90,000 bottle drop account holders can donate their funds online to that fundraiser if they wish. That was a system that we just introduced um, in January. And now what we're going to do is add the ability to purchase and drop off large amounts of green bags for fundraisers as well. And this may not sound that complicated, but it actually is complicated in terms of operations from the back end. But in a couple of months, we're going to give fundraisers the ability to buy, you know, say three or 600 green bags if they want to. They're going to be able to pre-label the bags and hand the bags out to all their supporters. Then all the supporter has to do is fill up the bag with containers, drop it off at any bottle drop center, and that money will automatically go onto the fundraising account. Um, some people may, some fundraisers may collect some green bags at their place of business or place of operation as well. And so we're also going to allow fundraisers to do larger bag drops at the center of themselves. Um, that combined with our online featured fundraising we think is gonna be really popular and really, really exciting for a lot of our nonprofits. And the last bullet point, I would love to have more information on this. I don't have a slide on it because it is brand new in the works, but we are also going to be introducing a rural drop box program. Now, when we talk about bottle drop centers and where we're gonna build them, it's only financially feasible to build a bottle drop center where the population and the volume warrants it. It's an expensive project. As I said, we don't use any Oregon taxpayer dollars, so it's all privately funded. Also, the distributors split the cost of general operating with participating retailers. So if you're looking at a small town where there's only one or two large retailers, it's just simply too expensive for everyone involved to build a bottle drop center. That being said, we wanna bring this bag drop program and these fundraising capabilities to 
everyone in Oregon that we can. So what we're looking to do is build a large drop box of some kind. Um, we have staff working on it right now, think shipping container, and outfit it so that people can drop off bags, print receipts, essentially use the green bag drop system in a rural area where a truck will then come and pick up the bags and they can still use the online account system. So like I said, that's brand new in the works, so you know, it's just between us. But it will be very exciting once we're able to roll that program out. To find out more about a lot of the things I'm talking about, you can go to bottledropcenters.com. Uh, that's where we have a list of all of our locations, all of our participating retailers, information about our accounts, all of our featured fundraisers, um, as well as our frequently asked questions and ways you can contact someone like myself if you have, if you have any questions. Speaking of questions. Sherilyn, thank you very much. And I can see people lining up already, so I won't say anything other than if we're ready for our first question. Go for it, Jim. Jim Cape, four member. Question, you didn't seem to discuss the non-returned percentage. I would assume that's a six or seven figure number. Thank you. I'm sorry, I don't quite understand the question. You mean like what's happening to them? What's happening oh, to the bottles or why? They paid for the deposit but didn't return them. Right, okay, so like the unredeemed deposits. Okay, excellent question. One of our most common. So in Oregon, since the bottle bill is not funded by any taxpayer dollars and the beverage distributors are the main entity responsible for making the bottle bill function, all, all the unredeemed deposits go back to the beverage distributors and those funds are directly used to pay for the pickup and process of the containers that are returned. So that fleet of trucks, the community outreach program, those eight recycling centers, those are all funded by unredeemed deposits. Believe it or not, the unredeemed deposits are not enough to fund the whole process, especially the bottle drop centers, because that's new. And so that's why those are funded directly by the beverage distributors and retail partners. Good question. Do you have a percentage? Do I have a percentage? Well, it's about um, s the last number that the OLCC reported was about 68% redeemed containers. So it's about 32% unredeemed, yeah. Uh, yeah, Tim Hutchinson, a former member. Uh, thanks very much for the presentation, it was great. Um, I've always had one question, and this is probably it's a very simple question, but why aren't wine containers part of this? It is a simple question, and it's, it's pretty much based on that litter concept. So um, the bottle bill is all about keeping litter off the streets. It was initially put into law because of litter, and because we have such a robust com um, curbside recycling program, um, we don't worry so much about things that are mainly consumed in the home, which is the exact reason that gallon milk jugs are not gonna be added to the bottle bill or you know, soap detergent or things like that. Wine is a little more iffy because you could make the argument that people do take wine on picnics or something, but the example I like to give people is, you know, do you see uh, teenagers driving down the road drinking a soda and throwing it out the window? Yeah. You don't usually see people chugging a bottle of wine and throwing out the window. I mean, hey, no judgment. But uh, so that's the basic reason is that they're usually recycled in curbside. Yeah. I have one other question, if I could, can I? Um, and that's, I'm trying to understand the structure of this group. Is this a for-profit uh, organization or is this a non-profit? You say it's a co-op, but is it a for-profit? And it, the, I guess the follow-up of that would be, uh, uh, how does this cash flow work? I mean, in other words, people are taking these, you have these bottle drop things and you're paying out. So uh, how do you, what do you apply to the, I mean, I, I assume that the, the grocers collect the deposit and do they send it to the state or 
and then then do you apply to the state for reimbursement for the you know like for instance if i if i take you know 24 bottle if i buy 24 bottles from the store they charge me the deposit where does that go does that go directly to you or does that go to the state and then the state does it and then finally are you the i mean do you have a monopoly on this or are you the sole recycler in the state or you know Sure. Uh, Maybe that was too many questions. No, so remind me what the first question was. Oh, I don't remember now. No, no, the first question is, are you a non, is this a non-profit or okay, is this so a for-profit? How, how OBRC functions and yeah, then just how, how the it's deposit, structured, how yeah, the deposit and, and works. And then how the cash flow works, where, okay. whether you have to apply to the state, and if sure. so, you know. So we are a cooperative corporation, and we have a very unique business model. Uh, we're not a non-profit, but we also don't make a lot of money. So basically, we're, we're member owned. So we're a cooperative of members. We have a board. And any profits we make off, say, you know, selling the scrap or something, which isn't much in this market, those shares are returned to our members. Um, and then we kind of just keep enough so that we can function, like in our staff and trucks and fuel and that type of thing. Now, in terms of how the deposit flow works itself, when, oh, I should have brought a slide of this. I gotta remember that next time. When retailers buy beverages from distributors to stock their store shelves, they pay a deposit on all of those containers, five cents for each container. So the deposit goes from the retailer to the, to the distributor. The, so the distributor's holding the, the nickel, we'll say. The consumer comes along and pays a nickel every time they buy a container from the retailer. So now the retailer has paid a nickel, but they've gotten one back. Then the consumer drinks their container and returns the empty, and they get their nickel back. Now the retailer is out the nickel again. That's when OBRC comes along. The distributors, who, who are our members, forward those deposits to us. We go to all the retailers. We pick up a certain amount of containers that have been returned to them and pay them back for the deposit on every returned container. Then, um, so the retailer now has their system. We take the containers away, and then we return, we sell the scrap, and then we return, use a lot of the money to function and return any um, profits to our, back to our members. Was that enough detail to? Yeah. So the state is not involved in, deposit, in the deposit flow at all. Um, I'm Bill Kroger, a forum member, and thanks for coming in today. Interesting presentation. Uh, we used to have a lambs uh, market in our neighborhood that had a recycling center that was very popular and busy all the time. Then Whole Foods came in and bought them out and c closed the whole thing down, so, which, which I thought was sort of crazy for Whole Foods. But I was just wondering, how, how do you have arrangements with the various stores? Do you recruit them, or do they come to you, or how does that work? And I have a second question. Um, what I do with my cans and stuff at home, I just recycle them each week when the garbage comes around. Is that what happens with those kind of cans and things like that? Okay, so the first question with the retailers. Um, generally, we recruit the retailers when we're going to be opening a new center. As we've gone along and we're getting more and more popular, it's... It's not a... We don't have to do as much recruitment as we did initially because a lot of them are you know, statewide or national brands or companies. So if we have, we already have a bunch of Safeways that are participating, so if we open a new center somewhere else, it's just a ma ma matter of contacting that particular Safeway. Um, now, the OLCC has, I mean, I'm sorry, the legislation has also passed a bill that gives the OLCC the power to make sure that retailers are, um, in compliance with the bottle bill. So what that means when there's a uh, redemption center in place is that any large retailer, meaning 5,000 square feet or more, if they're within a three and a half mile radius of a redemption center, they need to either participate in the center to fulfill their bottle bill obligations, and if they don't want to participate in the center, they have to offer a certain amount of convenience features that are similar to the bottle drop center. And again, that's something that is um, mandated by law and by the OLCC. So um, 
it's not it, we semi recruit retailers but it's a matter of law for them and so it just kind of depends on whether or not the retailer would rather handle it themselves or whether or not they would rather participate now most of them would much rather participate in a bottle drop because retailers don't like handling bottle bill containers it's a pain like i said they're trying to sell food and keep their stores clean and recycling uh, as much as we try to keep it clean it's a little bit of a dirty business so they would much rather have it off-site and be able to offer the convenience of the kiosk to their customers um, the second question oh the containers you recycle curbside anything you recycle curbside that doesn't have a deposit just gets recycled any deposit container that you have purchased and you put in your curbside you're essentially forfeiting that nickel and that's one of the nickels that goes to fund the, the recycling of the other containers that are returned. Chris Leslie, former member. I was wondering how you recycle glass. The bottles, are they washed out and given back to the companies? No, they're all crushed and, in, and put into um, a huge, I can't think of my words all of a sudden put into a big oven uh, where, they're, where they're melted down. They're actually most of our glass, at least the glass that's returned via the Oregon bottle bill is taken to Owens, Illinois, which is right near the air, or not too far near the, from the airport on 205. And they are essentially all made back into glass bottles. Uh, most of the glass that goes, gets recycled in curbside is generally made into some type of road surfacing. But because the Oregon bottle bill is such a clean collection, we call it a clean recycling stream, we don't have a lot of contaminants. So we're able to recycle almost everything that comes to us and our product is extremely clean so it's able to be used and made into higher grade product. And a follow up question, the taxes, you pay taxes I hope. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, we have auditors at our office all the time. We have to, you know, be straight. We have to keep everything above board. Thank you. Of course. Good afternoon. Mike Holcomb, form member. Uh, just a small question in reference to the premium uh, bag drop system. You're talking about fees, uh, so much for the bag, so much for uh, handling and everything. How are those fees handled? Do you like... Here, here's your quarter and your diamond nickel, or is, well, I dropped it off, it comes out of my account after you count the bags, and then you go like, oh, we got 20 cans, eight of them go to the processing. And yes, so between the cost of the bag and the cost of the processing fee, it comes out to about 40 cents per bag. We don't accept any cash at bottle drop, so everything, any fee that's associated with the bag drop system is taken from the account. Even if you don't have money in your account, your account is allowed to go negative. Um, Jim Cape, four members, sorry to ask a second question, but about your slide where it was recycle saves lives. So any of you give some specifics? <laughs> That's just my affinity for cartoons. <laughs> Can't be tripping on a bottle, you know. Uh, Phil Nelson, four member, thank you for coming today. I'm curious about plastic bottles, and I know it's not part of your direct presentation, but as with the glass, what happens to the plastic? And, the, and I guess there's a petroleum component in that product, and I understand sometimes it's kind of volatile as far as how much is paid for this kind of, of refuge, or these bottles. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Uh, sure, actually I'm really glad you asked because um, Plastic, it is a volatile market. It goes up and down. And it's highly affected by fuel cost and so forth. However, we used to ship most of our plastic loads to Asia. It just went to the highest bidder. Um, but in 2012, OBRC partnered in a project called Orpet. It's out in St. Helens, Oregon, and it is the first and only plastic bottle recycling facility in Oregon. Um, all of our plastic goes to Orpet. It's processed on site to the point of, of becoming flakes. So at OBRC, we take the plastic bottles in, we uh, separate and make sure they're all clean, and then we bale them into large plastic bales. Those bales are sent to Orpet where they 
flake and clean the material. So they cut it up in little pieces, and then they, they do a couple different types of washes on it to separate caps, labels, and bottles. And then they sell that clean flake to recyclers, uh, most of which are in the Northwest, some of which are on the East Coast, and they do have a few international clients as well. Just a follow-up question, Tim Hutchinson, board member. Um, so are you, so do you have a monopoly in the state? Is that, I didn't understand, because right. you didn't. Uh, I, I didn't, I forgot yeah. to answer yeah. that question. Um, yes and no. We, we certain there's like there's certainly no rule that someone else can't pick up bottles or participate in returning deposits to customers. In fact, the bill states that other people can do it. However, most states that have bottle bills, there's a handling fee connected to the bottle, which generally is paid by the state. Oregon, does, the state does not fund the bottle bill, and so there's no handling fee for picking them up. So you're literally taking in the deposit and then paying it back to customers. So there's just not a lot of money to be made unless you're getting the unredeemed deposits, which according to how our system is set, the distributors have those. So if you could convince the distributors to forward some of those deposits to you to work with, then you, know, then you could do that. But because the distributors have already formed a cooperative, it, there's just not a lot of money to be made for someone else. Yeah. And then, and then just a real quick question, which, yeah. uh, you know, you talk about this five cents and all that stuff, but then you also talk about <clears throat> the actual recycling. Are you able to make like uh, uh, like 10 or 20 percent just from the recycling? Or, I mean, is, it, is that a money thing or is it, uh, you know, because you say you sell it to the highest bidder. Mm -hmm. So does that mean, you know, so you're selling this, pla you, you don't have any money in it, right? Because you're just handling the stuff. So you sell the plastic, the this and that, I mean, what percentage of your operating costs does that represent or can you recapture by, you know, reprocessing? I couldn't, I couldn't give you a percentage on that just because I don't know it, <laughs> but I can tell you that the recycling, all recycling markets that we deal with, plastic, aluminum, and glass are all down. And so r recouping as much cost as possible from the scrap, it, that's, we do that, but it's not much. Um, it's, and it's difficult to find, you know, quote unquote, the highest bidder. Um, also something that just popped into my head regarding the plastic recycling question. Um, there's a company called Earth 2O and they've created a system where they do a completely closed recycling loop with their bottles. So they purchase flake from Orpet and they make a plastic bottle completely out of 100% recycled plastic. And then those bottles are picked up by us and go back to Orpet which is why we call it the closed recycling loop. So that's pretty cool. Anyway. Again, Mike Holcomb, board member. Another quick question. You brought, brought up the thing about caps. I notice a majority of the stores are like clean bottles, bottle only, no caps, um, have to have the label on them due to the fact of the barcodes and everything. These recycling centers, are we just going to be able to take our bottles, cap and all, and, and you'll take care of all that? Or are we, again, still having to half clean and try to figure out where to recycle our caps? Excellent question as well. Um, the whole cap issue has a lot to do with machinery, not with recyclability. So plastic bottle caps are absolutely 100% recyclable. Um, Sometimes curbside programs or certain retailers will ask that you remove the caps because when the caps come off, they can get down in machinery and gum them up. However, uh, at OBRC, we do accept caps and bottles with caps. In fact, most of our bottles come back to us with caps on. Uh, that plastic is a different density than the bottle, than the plastic the bottle is made out of. And so all those caps just come, go in the same bale. They're flaked up the same as the bottle into little chunks. And then they float at a different level than the plastic bottle part. So basically they're scraped off the top, they're cleaned, and then they are sold to recyclers. And um, our biggest recycler right now that get, buys our caps makes, uh, oh, plant pots, you know, like for plants. Um, at the bottle drop centers that we're opening, 100% you can return caps. We encourage it because we use them and we sell that plastic as well. Um, 
So hopefully that answered the question. Yes. I, I don't remember at the beginning of your speech if you talked about the volume, but I was wondering if you could talk about maybe how many cans and bottles or however you guys measure this, just to let us know what the volume is. Um, I, I don't know how many volume numbers I have, but we collect about 1.2 billion containers annually, and that's statewide, so that's through the bottle drop centers and through all the retail locations as well. That breaks down to about 23 million containers every week. Uh, fun fact, if you line up 23 million containers end to end, they would reach from Oregon to the Statue of Liberty. Wow. <laughs> Sherilyn, thank you very much. You obviously know your stuff. Um, you, this is the kind of presentation that could be bottled uh, and sold. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, next week we have our, our Secretary of State discussing the state of the elections, uh, which should be quite fascinating. Following that, we have Kevin Starrett talking about the gun issue. And while those are important, and I hope to see you there, I can't let you leave. I know you have a piece of paper in front of you that you ha have been handed. We are so excited for next week, Tuesday evening, at the Cedar Mill Library to have Congresswoman first. And I hope that not only all of you will be here, but I hope that you spread the word around. This should be an absolutely fascinating short presentation from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m., including a half an hour for questions. And I'm hoping that all the people that attend will wind up leaving there and becoming social, become socially active, not necessarily candidates, but if they want to, that's great too, if they can raise the funds. Ladies and gentlemen, one more time, thank you, Cheryl, and we'll, Sherilyn, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>